Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Troy Goodfellow. I am the PR manager for Paradox's historical grand strategy games. And I'd like to welcome you all to an event that I have been looking forward to for quite a while now. Uh, Paradox has been making historical grand strategy games for over 20 years now, which means that for a generation, many thousands of people have learned about the world and the past through games we have made, whether it's information about the British War Cabinet, the centrality of Ulm to the European balance of power, or the wondrous miracle of what we call gavel-kind inheritance. Uh, <laughs> Paradox games have been the launching point for many to unlock new interests in the past, and increasingly have become tools for teaching others. But are we really learning anything of substance? How do Paradox history games translate to a deeper understanding of history beyond the realm of geography, biography, and mere facts? To answer this question, we're very happy to have some guests who have thought deeply about how our grand strategy games communicate history on a more complex level. First, to my far left, we have Dr. Eleanor Yanaga from the London School of Economics. Eleanor is a medieval historian. <laughs> Thank you. Her specialty is sexuality, apocalypticism, propaganda, and the urban experience in the Middle Ages generally, but her focus is the 14th century Holy Roman Empire. Uh, she hosts two programs on the history hit TV network, Going Medieval and Medieval Pleasures, and writes the very popular medieval history blog, Going Medieval. Her next book, The Once and Future Sex, about medieval woman, women, is out in January. Eleanor, welcome to Stockholm. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And then we have Brett Devereaux, whose work may already be familiar to many of you. He's based at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He is an ancient historian who specializes in ancient economics and the Roman army, but he is also, most importantly, a very long-time paradox player. He has written extensive blog analyses of Europa Universalis and international relations theory and on the various game systems of Victoria II. These, as well as many other interesting essays on games and history, can be found at his history and pop culture blog, A Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry. Brett, welcome to Stockholm. Thanks. So here's how the next hour plus is going to go. First, each of our guests will give a short presentation on where they see paradox games meeting historical knowledge or historiography that interests them in particular. I'll then guide a discussion for a little while and then open the floor up for questions. It has been decided that Brett will open us and he will go first. Dr. Devereaux, the floor is yours. Obviously, I lost the twin cost. <laughs> Um, I should note before I start, all of this will be on the quiz. I expect you to be taking notes. Mm -hmm. um, I was excited when I heard that Paradox planned to have a historian's panel, as I don't need to tell you, um, for the last decade or more, Paradox's titles have been reshaping the historical game space, and so it made sense to have a panel of illustrious historians to comment on them. Unfortunately, of course, after two years of the world collectively pulling nothing but Comet events and the King's Ransom, I assume, that was necessary to get Dr. Yanaga on the panel to accept invite to court, um, there was only room left in the budget for, um, for me, the one admin single star uh, historian. I guess that's like a philosopher, so Troy, I hope the plus one prestige was worth it. <laughs> There's a challenge with discussing games in general and mechanics-driven games like these in particular as a historian. As a historian, we're trained to distill bits of information and meaning and narratives um, from records and texts and to teach students to do the same. Those texts and records, they tend to be narratives, they tend to be linear. You read them through from beginning to end. They're the same every time. Film can be a bit more complex, but it's much the same. There's a layering of sound design and visual design that can convey meaning, but it's still linear, it's still narrative, it's still the same through every time. But games don't merely convey meaning through a narrative, and they don't play through the same way every time. Instead, games convey meaning through mechanics and the ways these create disparate outcomes. Mechanics can be tricky to assess in the same way. 
There is no preset narrative, and most historians aren't, as of yet, trained to do it, although I hope that will change. What I want to do here for uh, my little bit is to explore some of the historical concepts, a small selection, that are delivered to the player in some Paradox games through the mechanics to show how these mechanics can convey historical meaning, how they can present a theory of how history works. And I want to take a very big picture question that historians ask, which is what makes countries behave the way they do in decisions of war and peace? Now, no Paradox game stops to lecture the player on this question. There is no big tooltip that pops up that is like, this is how you should make your decisions. And Paradox games are fascinating in particular because they have no win state. The game does not tell you where you need to go. You decide where you want to go if you want to paint the whole map or remain a one province minor for the entire game. That's up to you. And so it's instead through the mechanics that Paradox Games provide answers to these questions and fascinatingly provide different answers from game to game. We can start with the OG of Paradox titles, uh, Europa Universalis. Uh, normally here is where for an academic audience I would now have to spend the next 10, ten minutes painstakingly moving through the mechanics of EU4 to a crowd of people who have never played it um, and how EU4 works uh, entirely through mana the last time I checked through the forum. It's all mana. Um, <laughs> so this is very liberating. We can just get straight to the good stuff. EU4, as you know, has no win conditions, but it does have a failure state. If your state is extinguished, if you are conquered, you lose. The game ends. So every player is looking to avoid getting conquered. Your goal is don't get conquered, which is actually really convenient because there is a whole school of international relations theory which begins with the assumption that the first goal of states is to survive. Checks out. <laughs> but this has all sorts of follow-on consequences. The best way to avoid getting conquered is to become strong. Um, the easiest way to become strong is, is your own military power. You can try alliances, but you can also be diplo, vassalized, annexed um, if you are too weak compared to your allies. So the main way to survive is, is to build strength. And here you mean military strength. No amount of prestige is going to stop an invading army. Um, so I'm sorry, Troy, you should have brought a commandant instead of a historian here. It was a real mistake not to spec discipline. <laughs> Um, I'm I, never not said sure. it was, I never said it was good at European Universalis, I said I played it. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk through this problem with an example country, and I'm going to pick one of my favorite, which is Burgundy at the 1444 start. Um, Burgundy has a problem, of course, and that problem has a name, and that problem's name is France. <laughs> um, that's true for a lot of starts, um, and even for some countries today. Now, France is, in 1044, in the middle of a process of national consolidation, a, a process which, to be clear, is a historical process. It's inventing the nation of France, right? It is not discovering a France that exists. It is producing a France out of whole cloth, out of people who, in 1044, may not have realized that they were French, or more correctly, were about to become French. Um, and so in this period, France is aiming to consolidate its territory, and that territory includes Burgundy, long notionally a vassal of the King of France, in practice independent, and spent much of the Hundred Years' War on the other side. <laughs> the player's challenge is Burgundy thus is clear. To retain independence, you need to amass power, especially military power, rapidly enough to hold off France when it comes for you. To do that, you need resources, you need money, you need manpower. You could invest in building up province development, but the observant player will rapidly observe that conquering new lands is much cheaper and faster than investing in your own, right? Playing wide is a quicker way to military strength than playing tall. Uh, most players will notice this. They'll realize that if they want to outpace France and aren't some sort of bizarre three-dimensional chess wizard at this game, um, they're going to need to conquer to do it. And they're actually already beginning to learn things that have historical value and meaning that gains to successful warfare in this period outpace gains to investment. And that's accurate. Um, this is something argued by Azar Ghat in his book War in Human Civilization. A small change in design tweaking some of the um, coring costs and development costs could change this mechanic, could essentially mess it up. But here it follows on the historical reality that a state conquering new farmland was way faster than improving your own. 
The brutal logic then falls out through the mechanics. To hold off France, Burgundy needs resources. To get, Bur to get resources, Burgundy needs conquests. And so Burgundy is going to engage in a lot of aggressive warfare against weaker, smaller states. The small states on the edge of the Holy Roman Empire are the obvious targets. Historically, these very pressures led Burgundy into a series of disastrous wars with the Swiss Confederacy in the 1470s, culminating in the destruction of the duchy after the Battle of Nancy in 1477. The player may hope to do somewhat better, but real wars are a lot less predictable than the virtual kind. But the logic here is simple. To survive, Burgundy must come, become the wolf at the empire's door, snatching up whatever poor foolish children are left outside at night. And the same calculus is, yeah, I really love that metaphor. It's brutal. <laughs> uh, I'm a Roman historian. We do not have shame. <laughs> And of course, this repeats every state on the map, each with their own local menace and their own local victims. And this situation, um, we have a fancy term for it, where anything one country does to make itself more secure, because Burgundy is acting out of fear, makes every other country less secure, because they're afraid of Burgundy. We call this the security dilemma. And we're already getting into what is essentially a theory of history, an answer to the question of why countries behave the way they do. A system of states where there's no real restraints on violence between them. Each state is in an eat or be eaten race for military power, not because they necessarily want conquest, although they often do, um, but because being the predator is the only way to being the prey. What EU4 is teaching you through the mechanics is what um, in political science is called, this is a term coined by the late Kenneth Waltz, a system of interstate anarchy. There are no rules, and so um, every state is on its own. This is a key concept in international relations realism. And indeed, historians have often understood early modern Europe, and indeed much of the rest of the world, um, as just such an anarchic system. Uh, the historian William McNeil supposed that the relatively high degree of fragmentation in Europe combined with that anarchic system created particularly intense competition, which in turn led Europe to greater military effectiveness over time. The combination of that effectiveness and the need to outcompete rivals in Europe led European states towards imperial expansion into other anarchic systems that they disrupted by their arrival, resulting eventually in the massive European colonial empires of the modern era. Um, that argument retains currency among historians. It's certainly not the only one in that space. Um, you'll find it, for instance, in Antonio Andrade's recent study, The Gunpowder Age. Um, solid recommend for The Gunpowder Age, by the way. Okay. Now, in the classroom, I can explain European politics. I can explain the principles of interstate anarchy. But in the game, it's much stronger because the player just straight up experiences it. You feel the fear and the pressure pushing you to a style of behavior that is both optimal and also horrifying. And you begin to understand why some of these states made the decisions they did. Now, of course, at the same time, we as historians, we stress contingency and context. Not all societies worked the same in all periods. Individuals can have tremendous impacts. Norms, customs, and culture matter. And this is what continues to fascinate me with Paradox's titles, where many developers simply replicate the same mechanics over different time periods. We'll leave those lesser developers unnamed. Uh, they just flatten the historical differences. Each of the core Paradox games features mechanics designed to express something unique about that time and place. So we can take this same question and move it into, for instance, Crusader Kings. A player playing Crusader Kings 3 is going to find their efforts at ruthlessly expanding power certainly not blocked, but curtailed. Vassals are uncomfortable with offensive wars. You didn't need to worry about that in EU4. Um, and depending on the player character's religion and culture, the options for aggressive expansion may be limited, especially against your co-religionists. This too is expressing something about the past, the way cultures and norms can shape channel and even reduce violence. And it speaks to something about the Middle Ages on the broader Mediterranean. Continued efforts, albeit with limited success, to constrain violence. In Latin Christendom, the period saw the peace of God and truce of God movements forming in the Catholic Church. An attempt, mostly unsuccessful if we're honest, to restrain the often endemic violence between Christians. Begun in the 10th century, these were some of the first efforts in Europe to define non-combatants and try and ban violence against them. 
In the East, we see a sort of similar effort in the world of Islam. Islamic jurists, similarly concerned by escalating internal violence, attempting, with equally limited success, to establish religious norms against violence against co-religionists, and again, define non-combatants as outside the realm of violence. These efforts are in turn reflected in the game by the relatively more limited war goals available against co-religionists and also, of course, the sharp penalties for exceeding cultural norms of violence against prisoners and vassals. Failure to abide by social expectations leads to a collapse of trust and a collapse of power. A very real problem in the decentralized and personalistic systems that characterized much of the Mediterranean world during the Middle Ages. And indeed, personalistic rule itself is a way that CK3 is, in essence, responding to EU4's vision of history. You say that the sort of amoral interests of states govern things. CK3 says, no, it's personalities. The kingdom next to you could have an interest in conquering you, but if their ruler is kind, just, and temperate, it is not happening. On the flip side, you could have had a traditionally good relationship with the Bulgarians over there, but if their new king is ambitious, it's gonna be war. And that too reflects something about the way that these kingdoms were ruled. Meanwhile, in EU4, the player's actions as a state are much less constrained. Other countries react to the threat you pose, but you rarely need to worry about the infamy of your power-mongering ways, or the reaction of the clergy, or the offended consciences of your own people. They become weary of long wars, but they're fine with aggressive wars as long as you win quickly. And in Europe, at least, that expresses something about the culture of rule in the time period. The medieval genre of mirrors for princes, these guidebooks for how to rule, which were often very interested in notions of piety and fidelity, were being replaced by writers like Niccolò Machiavelli and Sir Thomas Hobbes, who stressed the need of rulers to act in the interest of the absolute power of the state. Um, without the constraints of any older systems of morality. At the same time, of course, in the EU4 timeline, the Protestant Reformation is fracturing what religious unity there had been in Western Europe, removing most religious constraints on warfare. And that, too, is expressed mechanically in EU4. It's heavily abstracted, but as the game advances, as your administrative efficiency rises, all in order to keep up with that brutal competition, wars become progressively less and less limited and more and more total, culminating in the game's equivalence of the wars of the French Revolution, which I'll note historian David A. Bell has termed the first total war in his book um, by the same title. So this idea that the norms of warfare are slowly breaking accurate to the period. That is happening. Another contrast we could take is with these models and that of Imperator's warfare model. Imperator, of course, has a pot-based system. It represents um, all of the individuals. Yeah, I'm a Roman historian. We have to talk about Imperator. <laughs> when, a, when a hostile army enters or secures a region, right, we see the destructiveness of warfare directly. Some local pops may be killed, others may be enslaved and transported back to their, the army's home territory. And indeed, those mechanics fit with how the Romans and their contemporaries understood warfare. The Romans, by and large, did not think of wars between, as between states. They thought of them as between peoples. If you read the Latin original, the Romans do not declare war on Carthage. They declare war on the Carthaginians, all of them, all together. And so in the Roman mind, or in the contemporary Greek or Carthaginian mind or what have you, there were no non-combatants, and they behaved accordingly. So the violence against civilians um, is represented in the game, and the player is even somewhat encouraged to reflect upon the destructiveness of this form of warfare, even though there are no systems to restrain it, because there weren't. Um, <laughs> None of this is accomplished through a pre-scripted narrative or a cutscene. The game does not stop to lecture you. Rather, with the assist from uh, occasional event text, this meaning is carried by the mechanics. Of course, that doesn't always mean that historical meaning carried by mechanics is always good or accurate. eu 4 systems of institutions, for instance, I've argued, do a relatively poor job of capturing what we know of the so-called great divergence, the rapid rise of military and economic power in Europe. The institution system presents this as a consequence of civilian, economic, and social innovations, which are weighted to be most likely to occur in Europe. But historians of this period generally don't focus that way, instead focusing on the roles of political fragmentation, the 
unique developmental trajectory of firearms specifically is divorced from other technologies, um, as well as the, frankly, role of the spoils of empire in fueling the rise of European states. And particularly here in the spoils of empire, the role of the transatlantic slave trade, which, alas, barely modeled in EU4. Um, mechanics with meaning can inform, but they can also potentially misinform. We need to read them critically, both as historians, but also as players. But that very fact speaks to the value in exercises like this one. Designers and developers working with the past as backdrop to their games assume a responsibility to design with care. And I will say, I think the folks at Paradox design with about as much care as anyone in the business. Because history matters, and for better or for worse, video games often provide students with a backpack of historical knowledge, accurate or not, that they bring with them into the classroom and into life, often without realizing it. And so in order to hopefully make sure that for better outweighs for worse in that backpack of historical knowledge, we need to have conversations. It's incumbent on historians to be critiquing these products in a way that players and designers can read, both for players to adjust expectations and for designers to, frankly, adjust designs um, and iterate, right? This is a learning process. And to make this a learning process and to learn to read mechanics the way we read texts carefully and critically so that we can provide that sort of commentary. And of course, also it's very important so that I can continue to claim that I am in fact doing <laughs> research when I dump <laughs> another 80 hours into my next CK3 playthrough. Research, I tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that, Brett. We'll now turn the floor over to Dr. Yanaga. Uh, um, so here we see the, the, the real duality of historian is that we've got a, you know, a military historian with an actual paper and a social historian with slides and vibes. So uh, <laughs> everything's going great. Um, so I'll see if I can actually get the slides to work. But um, a bitch is incapable of speaking without just showing you some medieval pictures at the same time. Hey, no, I want to go back. There we go. Hey. So, um, and also, as is, you know, my want, I'm just going to talk about the one that I know most about, which is uh, Crusader Kings. So, um, you know, as any good medieval historian, you know, that's the one that I'm kind of obsessed with and that I play through. So, um, you know, I thought I'd kind of tell you all a little bit about why. Um, starting with the amusing story of how I came to learn that Crusader Kings existed at all. Um, so I got a, an email to my blog um, where someone asked me a specific question. And they wanted to know why it was that the Basques practiced agnetic succession. Uh, and I was like, fuck, did the Basques practice agnetic succession? That, that's a great question. Um, you know, so then, you know, like, like a big old nerd, I like, went and dug into it. Interestingly, they didn't. And also there is no kind of like one overall way that the Basques had succession because certain areas of the Basque country, for example, in what is now France, they would have just like, put, like plain Jane primogeniture, nothing interesting. But there were other sections that had a really interesting form of succession wherein the head of the family could choose an heir. And they could just say, I like this one the best. This is my smartest kid. There you go. We're taking over him. Um, so I kind of wrote back to the person exploding this to them. And I was sort of like, where, the, where did they get this idea that the Basque have agnetic succession? So I'm Googling around and I was like, ah, Crusader Kings 2, which I hadn't realized existed at this point. A uh, shout out to being a broke grad student. Um, so, uh, and I was like, well, that's really interesting. And now the thing about that is, there is a kind of way of relating to history that certain historians, professionals have, which is now I hate Crusader Kings, right? Because it, it, it taught this, this person this, this incorrect fact, and it's very, very bad, and they shouldn't go around thinking about agnetic succession uh, in, in, happening in the Basque country. That is not what I was thinking. What I was thinking was, this motherfucker learned what agnetic succession is. All right, okay. Like, you know, they, they're, they're, they're like, I don't have kids who are coming in as first year university students who necessarily know that that is the case. And that is how I started getting into learning more about Crusader Kings and started playing. Um, so, Basically, one of the reasons why I think that gaming in general is such a useful pedagogical thing for me as a medieval historian is because um, nobody ever has the chance to learn anything about medieval history if you don't manage to do history at university. 
So, you know, the generalized way of learning medieval, I mean, and this is, of course, you know, a massive overgeneralization. I'm speaking more particularly of the English-speaking world uh, because uh, England wasn't important, so we don't pay attention to English medieval history because then you would have to admit that it was a backwater and no one cared. I mean, like, I shout out, like, I actually had to physically restrain myself at the Crusader Kings panel where I'm like, it wasn't that the Vikings were clean, it's that the English were dirty. <laughs> like, it, it, like, and, you know, the Vikings are the more cosmopolitan society. Everyone knew what a Viking was. Everyone was like, well, in English person, Jesus, no. <laughs> I'd hate to see that. So, you, you know, it, the, so there's, there are real political reasons why, you know, the med medieval history isn't taught. Um, but as a result of that, we can kind of like go around thinking, well, it's bad that people are learning it through video games. That's not what I think, because it's that or my students come into my classroom never having any, ex uh, any exposure at all whatsoever to, video, to uh, medieval history. And we know that medieval video games are incredibly, incredibly popular. OK, so um, there's a great study on this. I, I will tweet all of my references later because, you know. She, she loves to have sources. Uh, but so between 1980 and 2013, there were more than 600 medieval or medi medievalist video games that were released. They're not all as good as Crusader Kings 3, but that's okay, you know. Um, and so within these, a lot of the time, we just see medievalisms. Right, you know, there'll, there'll be a dragon, you know, like there's going to be, sure, maybe there's going to be a Viking, something like that. But it still caters in what we call medievalisms, which is sort of the stuff that Tolkien came up with, um, you know. So every medieval historian wants to pretend that they're going to be Tolkien. I mean, no, I don't. I, I, I know that I'm not going to do it. But, you know, uh, the, these things are kind of like based on like real solid research and people who know what they're doing. Um, but that doesn't always necessarily come through to the public subconscious that these are, you know, tropes that we're playing off of, right? So, you know, basically, you can rend your garments over this, and a lot of my fellow historians do. You know, isn't it terrible that, you know, people kind of learn something from Game of Thrones? And, you know, I'm not saying that I'm going, I'm not going to critique every medievalism that I see, because I will, because I'm a bit of a jerk. Uh, but on the whole, I would rather that people kind of get an idea about what the medieval world is, and that it is large, it's complex, and, you know, there are a lot of different things happening in it, from a video game as opposed to not at all. And in particular, I find this useful for my favorite thing, which is, um, you know, countering the myth of the Dark Ages. Um, because the problem is when people don't have an opportunity to learn about medieval history at all whatsoever, they start regurgitating myths. Um, you know, even on my way over here, when I was just, you know, at the airport, I was literally on Twitter being like, I swear to God, they bathed! I you know, and like yelling at people online. And if you don't actually ever teach anybody that there's a whole huge expanse of history full of complex and interesting people, you see people say that the reason that wedding bouquets exist is because medieval people stank so much, they were carrying garlic down the aisle at their weddings in order to cover the stench of their body odor. That's not real. Just, like, I just want to be really clear on that. That's not real. And the source for that was a bridal magazine. That was selling flowers. I know, right? Even the English. No, because, well, actually, think, if you think about it, it doesn't even work on its own terms because if an entire society doesn't bathe, they wouldn't know they smelled bad. So why would you be covering your... It, okay, it just doesn't work. Like, ask a social historian, right? So, you know, there, there are things of that nature. Um, you know, and one of the things that I see most frustratingly is that, you know, there's an idea that this is a time of stagnation. Um, and one of the things that Crusader Kings in particular is good for with this is that it shows you an actual development of the medieval period over time. So I love things like, you know how you're always racing against the clock? We're like, oh, quick, primogeniture is coming in. I've got to, you know, do something, you know, or, or you're like, come on, primogeniture. I have 14 sons, uh, you know. I'm playing Iberia at the moment, so I'm, you know, it's, I'm very stressed about it. Um, so... Having things like that is really, really useful because it presents the average person with the idea that, yeah, this is like, you know, give or take 1,100 years of history, and things happen. Developments happen. Actually, over time, you know, you will get a huge range of thought. Um, so knowing that there will be new technologies that crop up in Crusader Kings, that's like one less student that I have to teach. You know, yeah, there's they're scientific advancement. It absolutely does exist. Do they have the word science? No, they don't. 
but you know, it, it's not always just going to be entirely the same the entire time. Um, and uh, that's particularly good with you know medical history, things of that nature. Really, really helpful to kind of get that that output forward and counter really pervasive myths in our culture that just say that this is a you know a terrible time when nothing good ever happened. Um, it also introduces the fact that there is kind of like a differentiation in what's happening across the medieval period. This is kind of something that we really deal with. Again, it's English speakers' fault, and French speakers. You know, the, the two worst groups of people. Um, and, you know, and, and this is because as a result of colonialism, the way things have kind of like shaken out in the 20th and 21st century, we tend to see um, our history is privileged over everybody else's. Um, and so you could be forgiven for thinking that the only two places that existed in medieval Europe are England and France. When, again, nobody cared about England, it's not important, I don't know how much to say how unimportant England is. Um, whereas, you know, if one were to go over, for example, to Timbuktu, that's an incredibly important place in the medieval period. Or if you are going out to, uh, you know, um, even into India, or into, you know, what is now, like, you know, Iraq, or into Persia, these are places that have immense and important social integrity to them. And Crusader Kings actually introducing the idea that there is an Afro-Eurasian medieval, medieval kind of experience and that everywhere you go, these things are different. You're going to have different cultures. You're going to have different levels of understanding, different levels of connectedness is immensely important. Um, and moreover, it also does a lot to counteract the idea that Europe is simply kind of like floating in space and completely unattached to the rest of the world, you know? Because you know, on the one hand, you know, you might have myths that say, oh, well, you know, only Europe existed, but then you also have myths that are like, oh, well, Europe was like a, a, a terrible back water and they didn't know about anything and you know they were they all stunk and were eating rotten meat and things like that that's not true you know you could get you can get chinese pottery you know to your court if you need to in the 12th century like that's something that is available to you so crusader kings does a great job of you know complicating what can be a really dull and eurocentric and not even just eurocentric but western european idea of what the middle ages is um and then one of my very favorite things is it actually gives a timeline of what the Middle Ages is. Great. Do you know how few people actually know when the Middle Ages is? A lot. You know, so like when I'm yelling at people about how medieval people bathe, they'll be like, I think you'll find that Henry the 14th only, and it's like, homie, like Louis the 14th is a modern ruler. Like you know, the, the modern period starts like basically, uh, you know. Sure, if you want to say fall of Constantinople, I'm very happy to use that. If you want to blame Martin Luther for it, I'm happy with that. If you want the Columbian exchange as the end of the medieval period, I'm happy with that. But the number of times I have to defend medieval people against an accusation about something that happened in 1675 is, <laughs> you know, incredibly annoying. And Crusader Kings does this, right? You know, you get a good timeline when people are like, oh, okay, well, that's medieval. And just really being able to literally get people to have some dates in their head incredibly important and much more difficult than it really ought to be. Um, but then here is the thing. So we were already talking about this last night, like Brett and I. So um, one of the things that's really interesting about both of our work is he is a military historian who really understands social history, and I'm a social historian who's kind of interested in war. So that's good. Uh, so we work well together. But one of the frustrations that I often have with the way that military history is presented to the average person is that the only thing that is historical is wars. I'm like, that was it. There was just some wars. And then, like, you know, it's a battle and then a battle and then a battle. And, like, that's history. And, like, no one ever sat down and read a book. You know, like, there was, there was, never, there was never, like, time to go to the joust or whatever. There, there's, there's just nothing but unending war. And, you know, this, again, has a lot to do with our, what our societies are and what we, like, privilege as important, you know. Um, in Western societies where we want to spend a lot of money on militaries, we have to be like, you know what the important thing is, guys? Militaries. You know, like, maybe you should shove some more money in there. Yeah, even more. How many times your GDP? America. I'm looking at you. Uh, you know, things like this. So we, we, we focus on military history and treat that as the only kind that there is. You know, the number of times that I have to kind of, you know, deal with being treated as 
unserious because I talk about the fact that sex existed. When it's like, if I was like, there was a sword at the time, people would be like, oh, give that girl money. She's talking about sword. <laughs> you know, like, no. So, you know, there, there are things that are integral social, you know, part of the social fabric of our society that people simply don't look at because it's not serious, whereas military history can be privileged. Then this obviously produces a really inaccurate view of the Middle Ages as just a bunch of wars, just a bunch of battles. And sure, you know, the Hundred Years' War exists. I'm not saying that it doesn't. I love the Hundred Years' War. Let's, you know, it's perfect, no notes. Um, but what Crusader Kings actually does is that it shows that it isn't all just war, and every single war and every single battle that ever broke out wasn't inevitable. You know, it has to do, just like Brett was saying, with what the personalities of various rulers are. You know, you can have entire wars that are just kind of predicated because someone's a bit of a dick. You know, uh, Richard the Lionheart, for example, was just kind of broke and a jerk, and everyone was like, could you go attack a castle and get out of here? Um, this then weirdly got, like, re rewritten into him being a hero somehow, and I will never understand it, but, like, this is anti-Richard the Lionheart action. You know, that, that basically very serious about it. So, one of the things that the Crusader Kings does is it says, you know, there are all sorts of things happening. There can be diplomacy. You might just go talk to a guy and be like, hey, I'm a pretty nice ruler. You want to be vassalized? And they'll be like, yeah, sure, G. Sounds great. You know, like, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not above forcibly vassalizing anyone, to be clear. But, you know, I'm, I'm just saying. Like, it, it shows that there are a range of options, and that's really good. Diplomacy is a huge part of how, actually, the medieval wor world works. Being able to send someone to court with a loot and a polar bear you know, in order to make friends is a much, much more important thing than you would be able to learn if you never actually managed to uh, break a book open at some point in time. Um, the other thing that I like is that it's not just kings in Crusader Kings, which is ironic given the title, but that's fine. Um, and, you know, this is again one of the issues that we have. There's a focus on kings. You know, everyone I ever know who said that they didn't like history, it's because they were presented with the idea that history is a series of names and dates. It's like, here's the name of a king and here's a date. Here's the name of a king, here's a date. Uh, I'll let you on a secret. No historians, no dates. We go look them all up. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, like, I know a couple of them. I can be like, the Golden Bull was signed in 1355. Uh, okay. Charlemagne's coronation, Christmas Day 800. I, there's two. I'm doing great. Um, so, but, you know, one of the things that Crusader Kings does is it presents the range of people even who are just at court. There's physicians. There are tutors that you need to bring in for various things. There will be any number of individuals who are coming and going and who represent really important people within this cosmology. Um, another thing that's interesting about it is it's not just kings because there do be queens in, in Crusader Kings. And it's great. One of my, my most successful and beloved uh, run through that I ever had when I made a really big Bohemia. I had Queen Yitka last till 92, even though she was a depressed drunk. <laughs> um, and like we, we got like three shores for Bohemia. I made everyone be Czech. It was great. They were speaking Czech in Milan. I, you know, it was great. It was great. Um, and that's actually really accurate to the medieval world. There is this idea propagated by the French in the Hundred Years' War that you know you can't actually you know pass down line through women, and you know nothing could be further from the truth. And indeed, even if one isn't necessarily a queen regent, you know the one of the things that Crusader Kings does very well is it underlines how important women are in court. They're doing jobs, they're making alliances, they're, they are actually wielding in a tremendous amount of soft power. And that's something that Crusader Kings brings forward and it really complicates the super dull narrative about, you know, it's just a bunch of dudes who sat around and fought. Um, I also like how there's peasant rebellions. So uh, that, they're my favorite. I, every time I got to put down a peasant rebellion though, I'm like, no guys, my little homies, you're right. <laughs> I'm, I'm very bad, you know, and, and, and this is actually a big way that I have noticed that people are now learning about, uh, for example, the Republic of Dithmarschen. So I have like lots of people coming to talk to me about the Republic, yeah, that's right, my boy knows, uh-huh, and, and I'm obsessed with Dithmarschen, like those are my homies, like absolutely, shout out. And people are learning about this, right? And, and that is so exciting to me, you know, it, instead of me having to like somehow get in front of a large group of people and be like, I think you'll find that sometimes peasants, you know, like that's not something that I have to do. People already have that. That idea is out there in the public consciousness, and it's really, really useful. Um, and also, you know, like, shout out to the petite bourgeoisie. We also have, you know, a lot of uh, emphasis on the fact that there are marketplace concerns. Trade delegations show up. These things are important, and in fact, one of the most important things about the medieval period is trade. 
You know, um, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be here in Stockholm and Stockholm wouldn't be such a wonderful place if it wasn't for the wool trade. You know, like the, the medieval wool trade um, will go on to be, you know, one of the most important things in the world. And, you know, sheep are tremendously important. And one of the things that Crusader Kings does really well is highlight that. Nothing matters if you can't get your wool across the North Sea. I'm sorry, but it, it simply will not. Um, now, and then I also love my favorite thing at the moment. I simply love to romance my wife. Mm. Uh, in uh, Crusader Kings. And um, one of the things that it does really well is, yeah, okay, I like, actually, the way that Crusader Kings does, you know, show you that, like, when you need to make a royal marriage, you go to the wife store. That's what my mates and I always call us, like, yeah, going wife shopping, here we go, you know. Uh, and it's very, very fun, and I really enjoy doing that. And it's accurate, because for royal and noble people, nobody cared how you felt, I, like, no, no one gives a, a damn about you know, you know, your love life when you're a king. And that's really useful to counter a million Disney stories. And I know that it shouldn't be something that I have to say, but it's something that I have to say. You know, the, the marriage is a business contract. That's all well and good. Um, so this provides a real opportunity to kind of understand how it is that arranged marriages come to be, how, why you would do this also at the same time. So, you know, it kind of humanizes what we see as a really inhuman uh, kind of a way of thinking about things. Because now that we see you know, marriage primarily as a romantic institution, it makes us kind of think, oh, all medieval people are monsters. But if you actually are sitting around thinking about, well, what's your grand strategy as a ruler, suddenly, like, yeah, you can probably put up with that person for a little while. It's like, depending on the size of her dad's army, yeah, you know, like that, that could be pretty good. Um, but I also really like how it shows the opportunities for romance that actually did exist at court. So this is, this is a great way of me explaining to people how it is that courtly love came to be, right? And how it is that, like, most romance is with someone else's wife at court, you know, so it's like some married woman and the knights who are horny for her, you know, like that's, that's courtly love, you know, and it's absolutely great. But I'm really, really into at the moment, as I say, romancing my several wives. I've got some witch wife at the moment in Iberia and she's not having any of it, but I'm like really attracted to my evil witch wife and she doesn't, I'm going to get her in the end, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's nice to kind of also have these opportunities to show. But, yeah, there's exceptions to this rule. There are still, you know, ways where you could end up having a love match, even if the things were done politically at the same time. So, you know, the idea that romance is something that grows over time is even also just a wonderful thing for us to just teach people generally. Like, maybe you don't, you're not just in love with someone the minute you meet them. Maybe it's something you need to work on. Uh, that'd be great if people could uh, learn that in the real world. So, all of which is to say that for me, one of the reasons why Crusader Kings is so important is that for me, getting started is the point of learning about history. You absolutely have to start some people somewhere and anything at all that gets people thinking about the medieval period, thinking about it as a really complex area of time and also as something that is for them is useful to me. A lot of people tend to think that maybe the medieval period is just too complicated. Like, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of Latin, homie. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, but a lot of it's in translation if you don't have time to learn it, you know? I want people to understand that medieval history is something that they can feel ownership of and that they can really, really enjoy. And Crusader Kings does that. Um, and I suppose within this, a thing that is really important to me is that not everything has to be perfect and, like, accurate. Right? Well, it's not accurate. You're playing a video game right now. You're not the king of Castile. Okay? Like, you know, so I don't, I don't, need, I don't need every <laughs> single thing to be perfect all the time. It doesn't bother me that there wasn't agniatic succession in the Basque country. I, what is, there's, but the point is that there it was room for agniatic succession in the Basque country, and people can think, oh, well, you know, here is one form of, of passing things down. Here's another one. Um, and I think a lot of the time within what, you know, pedagogy for a large scale, perfect is kind of like the enemy of anyone getting involved. Like, I would rather something be really fun, engaging, and not 100% accurate if people are engaged with it. You know, I don't, I don't need, like, a, a, a bullet-pointed list that people are going to go through. Like, who are, you're not going to bring anybody in with that, right? Um, and so I am excited because this is why people ask me questions about Crusader Kings, right? Um, because the thing is, people are actually really smart. 
and this is something that I feel like uh, not enough is actually uh, talked about this. So when people see something like Agnetic Succession in Crusader Kings 2, it was 2, uh, you know, they come and ask me a question about it because they don't just necessarily take it on board that this is the case and this is definitely the way things are. If they want more information about it, they're smart enough to go find a medieval historian and say, can you tell me more about this? It's not the case that actually people are so incredibly gullible that they're like, oh, I played a video game once, so every single thing down to, you know, the brass tacks is perfectly historically accurate. They understand that this is a series of guiding principles. People are really savvy media consumers, and I think that's actually especially true about the sort of people who want to play a game that's as complex as Crusader Kings. You know, it's, this is not kind of something that you can sort of like wander in and wander away from again, right? It's a, it's a really discerning group of people who understand media and know that not everything is probably exactly accurate. And, you know, frankly, that's all I'm asking for. Like, please just like medieval history. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's a cult, and I'm, I'm leading it. I just want people to really, really like it. Um, and I think that that is why Crusader Kings is so incredibly, incredibly important. Um, I just want to state to, um, again, I will tweet these later, but there are a bunch of really, really great um, academic books that are out that specifically look at using uh, video games for the teaching process, a lot of which uh, talk about specifically uh, paradox games, which is fantastic. Um, so these these are like they're academic books, so they're expensive. So get your library to order them. Your library will order a book for you if you ask them to, just so you know. Um, and then you don't have to pay like the 70 bucks for the book, and then someone else can read it. Um, but all of these are really, really um, excellent. I especially re really like Catherine Lewis's work um, in this area. But all of these people are absolutely brilliant. They've got tons to say, which is not just you know me getting really excited about how much I like Crusader Kings. Uh, but yeah, so if you have any questions at all, always happy to answer them. Hope you do. But also check these guys out too, because it's not just me and Brett. There are other people doing the work. We're just coolest. So yeah, yeah, like that's all. Yeah. There are dozens of you. Yeah, dozens. 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 <laughs> You know what, I was gonna lead some discussion and do some questions, but I really don't have a whole lot to add here. So I kind of want to throw it up to our engaged audience, open to the class, uh, and see if they have any questions for our group here. And if I have anything to contribute, I will, but there's a mic that's going around. It's starting in the back. Oh, lucky me. Um, so when it comes to agniotic uh, succession, uh, in Crusader Kings, usually it's really tempting to uh, figure out interesting ways to kill off your children uh, so it doesn't become such a complicated problem. I wonder, is there many historical examples of uh, similar because the ruler uh, didn't want their legacy to be uh, torn to pieces when they uh, passed away? So... <laughs> uh... I think, the, I think the clearest example I can think of of a system that is trying to deal with the problem of partible inheritance that way is, is probably Ottoman fratricide. Mm -hmm. um, that once it became obvious that you, you have a, a tradition of inheritance that is coming from a pastoral society, partible inheritance where the primary thing you're inheriting are herds is great. You split up the sheep a few years later. Everybody has a herd of sheep because that's what sheep do. Um, transitioned into holding a large territorial empire was really awkward. After the first few generations where this produced almost predictably catastrophic civil wars, um, the tendency became rather than using your sons as administrators, confining all of your sons to the palace, um, and then when the old sultan died, whoever won the power struggle would be physically in possession of all of his brothers, who he would then have murdered. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is the sort of the sort of the closest immediate equivalent um, I, I can think of. Uh, I, I, I'm not endorsing this system. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting one because um, from a medieval standpoint, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, most medieval kings seem to kind of approach like the pre primogeniture days as like, well, this sounds like a you problem, my sons. <laughs> like, I don't really care what happens in terms of like, you know, when after I'm dead, like I'm dead. And so it's like, here you go. There's Lotharingia, you know, thanks, Charlemagne, uh, things of that nature. <laughs> yeah, Lotharingia joke, anybody? No? Okay, it's fine. Uh, so, you, you know, like uh, Charlemagne doesn't necessarily care that his, that his empire is being split between his sons because you know he's dead. It's not. It's not his problem. This obviously becomes more of an issue 
over the time period and as you you kind of have a differing way of relating to the idea of a state. So the Ottomans are, you know, the prime example because it's not just that it's an empire, it's also a state, it's a bureaucratic system, it's all these other things. Whereas for earlier medieval people, a lot of the time they're just kind of like being the fanciest guy. Uh, and, you know, it, and it, it's a lot more about kind of power relations. And so, for example, does the King of France really control France or does he just control a, a series of contracts between individuals? You know, he doesn't necessarily think that he's passing a whole bunch of, you know, land on um, until sort of you, you hit the Hundred Years' War, obviously. Um, so we see less of it than you would think. But, you know, this is one of those kind of like differences between games and real life because it's like, well, yeah, when you know that you're going to die and be reincarnated as your son, you're like, well, some of these guys got to go, you know, but when, but when you're sure you're actually dead, you don't necessarily care how much like your kingdom is going to be an integral part, provided your family is okay. And, and the, you know, people do be loving their families actually turns out. Yeah. Odd. People loved their kids. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so something that I really come to appreciate when um, uh, reading, especially Brett's blog uh, is how, uh, the, uh, the people, especially the rulers of medieval era, took uh, and scholars took great care to preserve uh, all the like ancient texts they have. That they, they keep replicating them, and uh, <coughs> like, uh, we have this. Uh, we don't have the original manuscript, but we have uh, this uh, copy, which was made in the 14th century or something like that. And like, how do you, as historian, uh, historians, feel toward these people who? preserved it for you um, so so yeah so the 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 point here because I just want to stress this just generally speaking um, the people in the early Middle Ages were not responsible for the loss of classical literature they were responsible for the preservation of classical literature right literature doesn't preserve itself mm hmm Oh, and yeah, you're putting quote marks on classical. That's fair. Uh, classical here is a time delineator, not a judgment of quality. Yeah, that's right. Though Roman literature is the best. Um, Homie. Okay. <laughs> sure. I don't know, man. Whatever you need to tell yourself. It's uh, fine. <laughs> um, but right, um, and sort of how do you think, I mean, so one, you are occasionally grumpy with, um, with, with these folks because they're making their own decisions on what to preserve, mm -hmm. and they are understandably not considering what a weird historian in the far future will think. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, Cicero gets preserved a lot, a lot, a lot. We oh, have a lot Cicero. of Cicero. We oh, have so God. much Cicero. And the reason is that Cicero was the primary instructional text for Latin prose. He was supposed to be the best prose writer, so if you needed to teach a whole bunch of monks to write Latin prose decent, you're like, go, just go read Cicero. It doesn't matter what Cicero, just here's a, just a whole creative Cicero. Go for it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, other authors were, were not so lucky. Um, a lot of the technical ancient Roman writing um, wasn't particularly useful. I mean, in part because while I'm describing it as, like, technical, if you've ever read something like Pliny's Natural History, like, 0% of what he says is true. It all whips, though. It's all good. Oh, no, it's amazing. I, I okay. love Pliny. He's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but an, an adorable idiot. Yeah, I, I think it, that's a, a really good and interesting point because, you know, the way that medieval people feel about classical texts is, you know, one of the things that's really excellent about them. You know, they, they've got the, a real kind of reverence for the past. And that, this is one of the things that drives me insane. Like, you know, the, the myth of the Dark Ages. Everything. It's like, oh, everything was great when Rome fell. And then medieval people were just really stupid. I'm like, probably one of the biggest problems with medieval people is they liked classical stuff too much and kept just trying to do it um, and like actually maybe we should learn some things sometimes instead of just like copying out Cicero um, so you do get these problems where it's you know the same text five times or there are certain authors that I would like to see but you know they just have a different cultural way of looking at things um, and I love them for that you know like it's neat that they're they're weird little guys um, and I think it, it's it's important to emphasize that medieval people are weird little guys um, with their own ways of thinking about things and doing things um, and I, I suppose so there's a, um, a really, you know, nice story about this that, you know, you can all take out in the world. So um, when you see myths about um, how much uh, medieval people didn't know anything and how everything was bad after Rome, um, when the Renaissance happened, it, 
there's no such thing. It's fine. Uh, but, but, but when uh, everyone decided that they wanted to, when, when Italians wanted to start a really big smear job on the medieval period to make you convinced that Italians should run at everything again, um, and invented the Renaissance and started looking at classical texts, um, they went and changed the way that they write. And the way that they did it was they were like, what's the oldest classical text that we can get a hold of? And so they started looking for, you know, Aristotle and Cicero and things of this nature. So they were like, aha, I have found it, the oldest script that there is, and now we are going to change. There's a, there's a script called Batard, it's really hard to read, I have to deal with it all the time. And they were like, let's stop doing that, let's do this instead. And now this script is called Humanist Script. It's based on Carolingian minuscule. Mm -hmm. So, um, the oldest one that they could find, and what they thought was most classical and the best, is actually medieval. So, Renaissance people don't know what they're talking about ever, anyway. And medieval people are where it's at. And actually, yeah, Carolingian Middle School is so, so good that it, like... Oh, so good. It's so good. It tempts a lot of people into doing early medieval things just because it's way easier to read. So, it's like, you're only going to have, like, seven texts that survive, but you're going to be able to read them all. All, uh, all of them. Car where, Caroline Minuscule is the best. Yeah, whereas it's like, I've got eight million texts that survive, and I can't read a damn one of them, because it's just like a mess. But um, So, y th there is this, we are really, really indebted to this group of individuals for our own culture, and um, it, it, I suppose the way that I think about them and the way that I feel them is like, let's give them more credit, because like, what a wonderful thing that they've done for us, and it would be nice if we could stop slagging them off, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, so, I don't, I don't know how, really how to frame this. Um, so basically, I grew up with paradox, um, mm -hmm. and now um, I'm kind of in the path to, towards becoming a historical sociologist. So this may be oh. kind of a sociological view of things. Um, but over time, I've come to realize that maybe uh, paradox games focus a lot on uh, interstate history. Even in cases of Crusader Kings, there mm -hmm. is focus on the centralizing power. Um, are there any other models of history that you'd like to see a paradox game tackle uh, somehow? Um. Oh, that's a tough one. So, uh, I mean, my mind jumps to sort of history from below, but that is essentially Vicky's thing. So I guess we're going to get that. Because um, that's my first thought. It's just sort of history from below. Mm -hmm. You're kind of in all school. What is the life of the common people? How is this influencing the structure? And this is what I talk about. Each paradox game sort of counterbalances the others. And in some cases, they are practically rebuttals to the way other games view history. The EU4 is totally state-focused. And I have not gotten a chance to play Victoria 3 yet because my time is tomorrow. Um, <laughs> But at least Victoria 2, on the flip side, is like the state is a sort of boat upon the waves of the people and the way that they are changing and that sort of, you know, top down versus bottom up change. Um, you know, as a historian, you have a, a sort of a, ch a choice about what you emphasize and, and what you focus on. I think we are both bottom up people. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I'm like, I, I'm like, uh, so are we going to develop a peasant game? Just like all peasants all the time. It's just like sheep, sheep, sheep. Uh, uh, and I'm like, I don't know, man, I might. Uh, like, you know, like in, in CK3 fishing, in CK3 sheep. Uh, uh, yeah. Sheep, I, I don't know, like sheep husbandry. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. um, but uh, it's an interesting one because um, you know, I'm so far out of my depth, I simply cannot tell an actual video game person what to make. But I'm like, yeah, you know, it, it, it is nice to see that kind of, um, you know, the, the acknowledgement that normal people exist. And, you know, the thing that I will never tire of saying, you know, about at least the medieval period is, you know, 80% of the population are peasants. So it's like, you know, when you talk about the medieval, you're actually talking about peasants, right? You know, 70% of them are unfree, you know? And, and, and then you've got like five guys with swords who are like running around and we talk about them all the time. Um, but, you know, the difficulty if you're going to do for something like that for the medieval period, it's like we, we don't get to know that much about them because of the way that history works. You know, they, they're all illiterate um, because of how society is and history is based on talk. Documents. But um, I think that one of the things that is really valuable about Crusader Kings is acknowledging that those guys are out there and they're angry, which is good. Uh, but, you know, I think that it's, uh, it's really nice to see, you know, like Victoria and things, things of this nature, like tackling that, you know, acknowledging the great bulk of history. Um, but yeah, I couldn't possibly uh, tell the devs what to do because I don't know how to make a game. I'm a medieval historian. Um, <laughs> You know, it's important to stay in your lane, I think, there. But although I would love a great schism, it's true. Someone said it, and now I'm like, yeah, can, I, can we get a schism? Like, 
a bitch loves schisms. I'm like, <laughs> three popes? Three popes, three popes, you know? Um, so, you know, and I'm just excited whenever I can get her sights, you know? So I was like, yeah. yeah. She loves I've, her her sights. Yeah. I love my her sights. And, and can I just say, um, God bless all the little court events where it's like, these yeah. peasants in this town have a dispute over land because, yeah, that's, that's like, that was the day to day of kinging is like, all right, you know, the burghers in the church and the peasants are all mad about who actually owes the rents on this field uh -huh. today. And I, actually, that's one of my favorite uh, things that is happening now in Crusader Kings 3 is I just love holding court. Mm -hmm. Like that's like um, I'm annoying everyone around me because it's just like I hold court whenever I can. I'm just like I'm about to see who's mad at me, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, right. and so I, I really like that because it, it does kind of like get everyday people into the courtroom too. And, and so there there is this kind of like idea that these worlds are completely separate. But as Brett says, it's like you never know when a peasant's gonna like show up and be like and and have like somehow faked a deed. You yeah. know, and, and things like this, like they're they're very they're a lot more clever than you would think, um, and so it, it's nice to see um, that that new gameplay come in, and uh, yeah, I'm like, ugh. right now I'm re really involved in like trying to get my Irish court to have like the best food. This is like something I'm really into. I'm just like, yeah, I'm like I'm like I'm like putting it all in on like Irish cuisine. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> We're gonna stop England from forming. It's <laughs> through through the power of food. It's gonna be great. So, uh, where's the microphone Sounds now? Amazing. I'm here. Hello. Well, first thing to say, no, don't stick to your field. Uh, I'm a classical historian, for example, and I'm also a game developer now. So Yay! you see, just move out of it. But no, seriously, um, my point was more about what you were saying before about, you know, the all sort of common people that exist. But the other phase of the thing is that not only we have common people, common people, but normal people, but at the same time, the fact that all the important people are people, are normal mm -hmm. people too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I don't know how bad it is in the medieval world yet that much, but I come in from classics uh, and you know that uh, it's a kind of common problem that people sort of have this myth, as you were saying before, about uh, that, you know, all people back then were oh so serious and austere and uh, so, you know, uh, proper, etc. And uh, instead, with something like Crusader King, it's something that personally I, personally I pursue and I love very much with events. It's just showing that, you know, at the end, they are just people. They mm. cheated on each other, they fell in love, they made a mess of things, they just fell flat on their face and did silly stuff. And so it annoys me to no end when you know, we get these comments, ooh, but this event, you know, it's not serious enough. Mm -hmm. People were not like that back then. And I'm like, ha, I have some nice, funny, historical uh, tidbit to tell you about it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I, it was already mentioned at the Crusader Kings uh, panel, like, you know, Raymond the Farter, um, a guy who existed. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's one of these things about actually medieval and classical people have like, uh, like a fifth grade level of humor. <laughs> they like they absolutely love a fart joke. They're mad for a fart joke, like way more than we are. And it's actually kind of like a, a, a sort of like a Victorian and on sensibility of like prim and properness that simply doesn't exist for them back then. And you know, if you were living in like one room with every single person you knew and kind of had to shag in a tent there and stuff like that, you might too end up with like sex jokes that you told at the table, right? It's a really different world and a really different way of seeing things. And you know our kind of desire, especially now, to kind of like see kings and queens, you know, like the, the it, it's hilarious when you, you see things like that and they're like, oh no, courts were all very serious. And I'm like, oh, the propaganda worked on you, huh? Like, do, do, do you also believe they have the mandate of heaven? Because I'm, I'm interested to, to, to hear more about this, you know? Um, so, you know, the idea that, you, the, that royalty are always like serene and kind of gl gliding through life is something that I, I would argue is really important to actively counter, and that's something that, that is really good and important that you can do here, yeah. Yeah, if anybody thinks the Romans were humorless, just read Plautus, <laughs> um, or, or Apuleius uh, for some, some uh, often really gross out body humor, mm. um, good, good stuff. And, and yeah, and also like just the often even of elites, the extraordinarily petty concerns. My mind jumps to some letters from Cicero where he's in Cilicia and one of his political allies back in Rome is going to put on some games and he's like, hey, Cicero, can you get me some Panthers? 
I heard there's some Panthers out there. Can you can you please direct the Roman army to go get me some <laughs> Panthers? Because that would be really cool. And Cicero like clearly does not want to get this fellow these, these Panthers. And um, no, that kind of stuff comes out. They're people. Mm. Um, people in the past are people. And so they have, they have you know, uh, people's concerns. They view the world differently than we do sometimes. They believe their own religion, mm. uh, something that, that people often forget. Yeah, they, do, they believe it. Oh, yeah. They really do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like. um, but they're people, and they have all of those same concerns. You know, they, they have relationships. They get tired. They make mistakes. They make weird decisions. Um, and, and I think you, you know... Uh, again, I think I think Crusader Kings in particular is really strong at bringing this out because that's its focus, right? Each game has its focus, and CK's focus is on the people, and so it brings that out really strongly. That like, yeah, no, I mean, this is a king, but you know, also he's a son, husband, father, mm -hmm. right? All of these other relationships. Sometimes all at once. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 and um, you know, and that's that's as much a factor. About, about his life, especially, you know, the decisions you have to make, sometimes choosing between, you know, do I do recreational activities that are going to make my character happy or go to war when these are mutually exclusive because they demand 100% of my ruler's time. And, like, that must have been weighing on people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How much of this do you think comes out of, to blame our favorite villain today, the Renaissance, where you have like, the literal men of marble, the classical statues, which then are austere white, yep. not the gaudy cartoon pink-faced Augustus. Mm -hmm. So everything seems more serious, more clean, more pure. Mm -hmm. so, and of course, Cicero, the world's greatest self-propagandist, yep. emphasizing how serious his concerns are. So we have the Renaissance pushing this idea back that, well, everything was great once upon a time. Mm. There's another thing I like Crusader Kings, how much color is in it. Yeah, oh god, I love that. As I, I, I'm just so sick of being like uh, presented with kind of like dry stone walls as like interior spaces in the medieval period, and you're like, no. So like, yeah, yeah, like the colors. That's a really, that's a really good point, actually, Troy, because it's, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the Renaissance relationship to the classical world is this kind of, as you say, you know, the bleached white one, where it's like, oh, here's a, here's a, a statue completely stripped of all the painting, and everyone was serious, and they were all great men. Yes, indeed. And, you know, like, and, and I don't think that anyone in the classical world really saw themselves as inhabiting that society. But it's a genuine propaganda campaign, and that's what, you know, the Renaissance was. Um, it's kind of like advocating for um, Italy to be the most important political bloc in Europe again, based on the fact that they've got a bunch of money. <laughs> you know, they're like, hey, we got money again. Can we have it back? You know, how about now? Um, and I, I, it's a, quite an interesting thing, too, because when you sort of look at it, you know, like uh, the ways that they relate to religion or the ways that they relate to, um, you know, literature, I, a thing that I always laugh about is like how we will decide something as Renaissance now, and we're like, what, did an Italian guy do it? And we liked it. Okay, it's like Renaissance, and it'll be like Dante's Inferno. This is literally something I, I've seen people say that it is Renaissance literature, and I'm like, do you know what a date is? Like, uh, but, y you know, even that, even now we all, we all agree, right, that, like, like Dante's a great author. I definitely think this. But um, he's writing fanfic about how uh, everyone who ever wronged him sucks. Um... And, 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 you know, I'm like, fair enough, homie, because, like, imagine, like, you know, you pissed Dante off once, and 800 years later, everyone's like, so that guy was in hell. Uh, <laughs> real bad guy, you know. So, but it, I, it, it, it's interesting because there's these kind of, like, petty little disputes where uh, if you just take this kind of, like, look at literature and the way history works, you're like, look at how, you know, the Panthers are enshrined. Or, like, you know, every one of Dante's enemies gets chewed out. Or the, the, the real messiness of history is what is actually there. And we were kind of sold this, like, by Vasari at all. This, this idea of the past is, like, a very, very serious place. And we, and we like it. We like that idea. You know, we're, we're responsible for kind of passing that on. Um, and instead of saying, well, actually, I, I don't know, people, people are odd, yeah. you know. Famed Stoic philosopher Seneca wrote an entire book about how an emperor he didn't like, Claudius, he just turns into a pumpkin. It's the apocalocentosis. You can go read it. We still have it. But, like, it's... I mean, it's not that funny, but it's reasonably funny. And uh, Seneca thought it was funny. But, like, yeah, they're, they're people. They do silly things. Hmm. Where's the microphone at? Hey, uh, 
I am a medieval historian, but I'm also a CK designer. Yeah. And we need to make like a lot of sacrifices for the rule of cool. Mm -hmm. But what is something that you guys see in our games that is so ahistorical that you're like, mm, there is no fucking way I'm going to make a Twitter thread right now? <laughs> like so ahistorical that I'm mad. Um, hmm, like that's, that, that's kind of like a tough one. Um, uh, because actually when things are like kind of ahistorical, I almost like them more. You know, like I, when, uh, it, and, and I mean, I suppose like the biggest way that I'm thinking about that there is, you know, like things that totally like didn't happen. You know, like when I've got like, um, you know, when I've got a bunch of Mongols who have like a breakaway country in Germany suddenly, you know, and, that, and, and I'm like, this is good, actually. Like I like this, and and, I, and so I like it when when things like that happen, or or when there are a little um, when, when new and crazy things happen, right? That that's actually more useful for me as as a historian than otherwise, because I think um, Brett and I were talking about this last night. Sorry to do the same conversation again. No, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I think that there's a tendency to kind of think that history was always going to be what it was. Right, and that history is always inevitable, and that it was always going to be this, and then that, and then this, and then that. When actually, you know, it's based on a personality, or you know, if someone, you, you know, on the battlefield's horse fell over, or you know, there are all these split-second little things where it's either going to be one thing or another, and there's no way of knowing when those, what those things are going to be, or when they're going to happen. And it's really not useful to treat history as like it's always, it was always going. Yes, you know, it was all a serious one line of the way, where we get to where we are today. And what Crusader Kings does well is, you know, complicates that narrative. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I haven't really come across anything lately that is like, I mean, you guys are really killing it, you know, like not to, but fucking stay on your toes. Because if I find it, I will roast you. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you do a really good job of, of kind of like looking into these things. So I haven't really found anything recently that's like a, a total howler. But I don't know, maybe Brett, yeah. you play more of them than I do, you know. I, I do, no, I mean, I'm thinking, uh, you know, I think, as I've been writing about them, I mean, I think I, I actually listed my my sort of biggest complaint, which is the the lack of representation for the transatlantic slave trade in EU4. Mm. Um, but I can also maybe understand why maybe the marketing department is like, please don't. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they should be ignored on that point. But then I, I, I'm a historian, so mm. you know, it's it's easy for me to be like, yeah, you guys should start a political controversy and I'll get fired. That's fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> But no, I mean, as, as someone who occasionally takes to writing long essays pointing out the howlers, no, I can't think of, I can't think of any where I'm like, that is, just, yeah. that is just wildly, frustratingly wrong. And yeah, which is why. So it's interesting because I, I think you guys do such a good job. I think that's where the idea that you actually have like people on your staff who are just paid to do the history or something like that comes from, because I've seen people do that, be like, oh, well, they must employ historians. I'm like, I don't think they do, homie, but, you know, like, it's okay. But it's like, but no, but I mean, like, but to only do history. Yeah. Like, it's like, because you know you guys are wearing a number of hats, I suppose is, is my point, is that you're all, like, you've got all got a good idea of history, but you also know how to actually design something, or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're doing 12 different things at once. There isn't just such a guy there like reading, you know, um, and so it's real testament to, you know, the breadth of knowledge just that's on the staff, I think. I mean, there's something I can complain about. Oh. The games need more silly hats. Ah, I need, I need more okay. silly historical hats, um, yeah. particularly for, for Crusader Kings. The Middle Ages has just an incredible wealth they of really silly love hats. Love a hat, man. Oh, it's just great. Love a hat, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, it's a, like, this is a, you know, when you get, uh, a, a thing that I really, really love is that, um, when Anne of Bohemia got married off to the English crown, and there, there was like, and everyone was like, you can't do this, you can't send a Czech girl to London, it's backwater. Like, a, a guy got sent from the Czech gar court to, uh, like, you know, be like, is London real? And like, they had, they had to like come back, and they were like, I guess, kind of. Uh, but anyway, like, she introduced a, a bunch of things like the Hackney Court uh, uh, carriage riding side saddle, and also um, the, the two horn. Had you like like the double horns? Like what if what if your hat had double horns? And all these people were like these damn checks. They just they they put two horns on a hat, you know. And it, and it was like this idea that like she was like too profligate or or something like that, which is very very funny at the time. So not only do you have extreme hats, but you have people who are really mad about the hats. Uh, and so it's like there's there's way more hat based drama than you would think. Yeah. 
sensing a future CK3 event coming out yeah. of all of that. Hat expansion, hat expansion. Yeah. <laughs> just, just call it hats. And I'm like, yeah. yes. Flavor pack, hats. It's finally happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where has the mic moved to? Hello? Yeah. So uh, thank you for both your presentations. Um, Eleanor talked about this a little bit in her previous answer, but uh, I wanted to, um, I realized that in games, um, you have to be somewhat clear about um, what went wrong so that the player can go ahead and learn to play better. And in a way that kind of um, gives a sense of causality, as in like things happen for a reason, in mm -hmm. a way. And I think a lot of history, from, from my understanding or work of historians, is determining that causality. And I wonder if you think there's any, um, anything that players learn about this, about thinking that like um, things happen for a very specific reason, which might not translate exactly to, um, to what you guys see in history. Mm. So I think actually, I'm going to start at this from the other end. I think one of the great strengths of paradox games is that things don't generally happen because of one reason, mm. that they generally happen because of half a dozen reasons um, of varying import all of which are contingent and have their own causes. And that, I think, actually trains people to think in terms of, of complex causality, which is good, because historical causality is complex. It's like, why did I lose the war? Well, I lost this battle. Why did I lose this battle? Well, I was crossing a river, but I did also roll a one in the opening phase. But also, maybe I shouldn't have declared this war. And in retrospect, the several decisions that led us to this point are a little bit awkward. And then all of this is conditioned by the fact that we have this religious animosity penalty. Um, and we have cores on either side. And then all of that is conditioned by these things. And then that kind of thinking of, okay, so there are social factors here. There are sort of moment to moment decisions that got made that were maybe not great decisions. And then there is just a good load of what uh, Polybius would call um, 2K, random chance. Um, you know, uh, uh, which the Greeks imagined as a goddess, um, 2K, uh, Roman Fortuna. And, and all of these play together to produce history. And I think that that is, you know, one of the advantages that it's not simple and, and hopefully players absorb to a degree the kind of humbling lesson of that, that causality is complex. And in the moment and indeed long after the moment, you may not understand all of it. Mm. I think that's a really good point because I think as historians, you know, yeah, we're, we're of course, you know, the, the thing that we're in, employed in doing is sitting around and looking at events and, and interpreting why it was that things happened or, or, or and what this means, right? Um, but, you know, the, the thing of that is, is that our theories of that are incredibly complex and it's never just like there was one thing so X happened. It's like, well, take into account, you know, the culture at the time. These people were quite weak. This guy had this going for him. This is just kind of like a bit of a smart guy. Um, you know, this person kind of like saw their chance and took it. And so what we're actually usually doing is kind of like weaving a whole big and complex tapestry that's got like a little bit from here, a little bit from there. And so sometimes then when you, we show it to people, everyone go, oh, there's a picture on that tapestry. Okay, that's that's interesting and we're like no but there's a tiny little string you know and uh, and you know there's a reason for that because obviously we want we don't want to scare people right when when, when we're trying to bring you in it's like we, we kind of like lure you in with a simple thing and then it's like you know and then and then you suddenly you're like learning about like again the economics of sheep yeah, yeah which so much of it involves sheep you'd be really surprised uh, uh, yeah like sheep. also I should know what you all don't know is that at the end of this you're all gonna be forced to swear homage to Eleanor over the giant throne. That's right. Uh, so. this, this was, in fact, a trap. Ha <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> ha! Now we're gonna have to lock the doors because it's I, it's not gonna it's not gonna go off. But uh, yeah, it 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 is interesting, right? That that there are all these like little things um, that that we, we kind of take for granted, you know, but it, it's not really that way. And so I guess the, the, the thing that most historians want you to know is, you know, it's my catchphrase. It's, it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Time for two more quick ones. <clears throat> yes, I were at uh, the event panel at Secret Tree and they, they refused to do uh, like Arturiana events. And I w was uh, wondering uh, uh, if uh, the, um, uh, like, were doing the myths uh, versus the histories mm. of the of the of the games uh, is that uh, like as historians, what is your take on that? Like the myths in the in in games. Oh, in game myths, yeah. 
I mean, I like the presenting of it at all whatsoever. Okay, so you know, um, again, you know, as a social historian, my major thing is like, l like, let's look at how things functioned, and I love the idea that there are, you know, stories that are told, and you know, explaining that this is complex, and there are there are huge and ongoing um, ways of communicating that are happening, right? So I love seeing kind of um, any any time you see. Um, like actual literature or anything nodded to in like the idea that there is this this complex and elite culture um, that's happening. I think that's really exciting. Um, I also think it's really exciting because um, one of the things that tends to happen, especially with medieval history, is that everyone goes, oh, well, uh, medieval people were religious. True. I mean, they were religious. Um, and so that means um, that they never had any fun and they never did things like, you know, tell kind of like outlandish myths or like have strange stories um, or tell, tell ghost stories, um, you know, have an idea about a monster or something like that. Whereas medieval people absolutely loved that, you know? And I mean, I think, you know, as anyone who's ever like met a Catholic now would know, um, just because the Pope tells you to do something doesn't mean that people are actually doing it, right? So, you know, there, there are, there are um, all these ways of kind of like having a complex world that has um, competing myths, competing mytho mythologies, stories that are kind of tr translating back and forth that people might think uh, wouldn't happen in a kind of like theoretically austere society. And it's like, yeah, but no one was austere. Right? You know, they want to they wanna know about Minotaurs, and they want to know about Blemier, and they want to know about, you know, any number of um, weird and fantastical things, and that's, and that's how they want to relate to life. So um, I think it's really um, useful to kind of have these acknowledgments of, like, what the cultural and literary world is. Yeah. 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 And I think one of, the, one of the advantages of the way that Paradox Games are set up, and this is often kind of a bit of, of their tongue-in-cheek tone, is mm -hmm. that all of the messages are delivered to you kind of in, like the fancy word here would be diegetically, like they're delivered to you as if you are the king. Um, and so if, you know, you're, you know, you have an event in CK and they were like, there's a giant monster. Well, like, yeah, somebody could probably say that. The game is not telling, like, you know, you know, Grendel is not now on the map. Um, he is yeah. not objectively existing. You're dealing with the belief in his existence, and that subjectivity is, I actually think, a fairly important way to think about what, you know, how people in the past, especially in the age before mass communication, experienced the world where there are huge sweeps of unknowns. I mean, we'll go back to, to good old Uncle Pliny, and, uh, you know, he has all of these beliefs about foreign lands and plants, uh, none of which are really true. Mm. Um, and that's not uh, unusual. Uh, if anything, Pliny was actually a very careful, assiduous researcher. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but... Um, Turns out if you just ask people who are making stuff up, that's not a great source. No, it's, it's, it, but, doesn't, it doesn't worry. But it is a source. Yeah. It, is, it is a source. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in a way, that sort of decision of, you know, these events are going to read as if you are there in the moment mm -hmm. um, allows the game to engage in some of this subjectivity and allows you to inhabit a place where, like, you know, your doctor is like, I'm going to try this treatment. Uh, and you're like, is it gonna work? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> you definitely don't. Uh, does that treatment actually cause your positive or negative health outcome? You don't know that either. The game pointedly does not tell you. Mm -hmm. um, right, and so um, I, I think that that's a good way to deal with that kind of, of extremely imperfect information that people are laboring under. Mm -hmm. Final question. Uh, as someone who also has no marketable skills but a uh, degree in history, um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always had a particular fondness for uh, the madness events in CK2, mm -hmm. um, especially the cessation of violence act, um, where you can forbid violence in uh, all your realm, um, which gives you a tiny opinion malice with everyone. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And no one takes this seriously, uh, because I've always felt that it's uh, a really good way of showcasing how there is a different relation to certain parts of the world. Like, like these people exist in a world where the act of forbidding violence seems absolutely ludicrous and no one takes it seriously. Mm. Um, what are some of your favorite events <laughs> wow, um... <laughs> that, that likewise uh, communicate uh, certain aspects of culture and society. God, because I'm like I'm like, I'm all about add-ins, so it's like I'm like uh oh, she's got to pare it down real quick, right? Um, 
so I think that my like, look, look, my fa is, some of my favorite things that are kind of happening at the moment, as I say, so you know, I'm I'm obsessed with um, I am really obsessed with uh, what is happening right now, like at courts. I'm really into uh, being a patron at the moment. I'm crazy like for being a patron like to the point where I have to be like oh this person actually isn't very good I can't give them money to make me a chest right now because um, I'm really obsessed with uh, with the patronage of the arts in general and um, like the guy I did my uh, PhD on was a preacher who got like imperial patronage and that's sort of and so that's the sort of thing that interests me um, and like I just uh, I just sent a woman from Iberia off um, to write a travel log and she brought me back a polar bear skull uh, and it, 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 it absolutely whips. So she like she killed like a dread bear up in Norway herself, and then brought me back the skull. And I was like, hell yeah! Like you're like you seen my bear skull? It's like I've got it above my throne. I'm like that's right, that's right. Everybody's seen it, you know. And so I really really love things like that. Like for me, um, at the moment, that's really exciting um, because it does kind of show that there is this um, real intense interest in in patronizing the arts, but also you get stuff back for that. Mm -hmm. Right, like being an artistic patron or like having, um, you know, exoticisms around your court does actually really make a name for you um, in the medieval world. And I think that's such a cool thing to, to focus on. So, you know, it, it's not all just, you know, it, it, you don't have to attack next door to be seen as a great king. Sometimes you can just like um, let a girl go on holiday, you know, and, and that might work too, right? I, yeah, I, I, I love the heck out of royal court. Uh, so good. It's, it's so, so good. good. <laughs> I, the the focus on on the sort of the daily business of of kinging, for lack of a better word, of, of rulership is is really fantastic. Um, if I have to get away from from CK three though, um, you know I've been playing some Hearts of Iron lately and 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 actually trying to use the espionage system for once, um, which I, I normally don't, um, and uh, and and trying to get that to get that synergy between, I, I need the espionage system to move synergistically with my military operations to provide this sort of moment where I have intelligence and surprise and the AI is confused and distracted to create that breakthrough. It really speaks to the sort of complexities of modern operational art is the fancy term of trying to, to sort of, you're trying to deliver this complex combined package of like, okay, you know, my attack is gonna be here. I need air superiority, I need to have baffled their espionage, like I need to round up all their spies the week before, um, and I need my own plan to lower their readiness to kick off just before now, and, and I've been moving my armored divisions into position, and I'm staging supplies, and then now I punch. Um, and uh, hopefully it all comes together and you break through, uh, and sometimes it just doesn't, um, because you're trying to coordinate a lot of different, a lot of different things, and that um, adding the espionage layer, I thought was was um, it adds a level of unpredictability because you know your espionage plans may just straight up not work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, both of you. Before we conclude entirely, I do want to recommend uh, Dr. Yanagos. The Middle Ages is a graphic history. This is perfect for if you have a very smart tween or teenager who's getting interested in medieval history beyond the idea of knights and castles and stuff. It's uh, well illustrated by uh, Neil Max Emanuel. Uh, Dr. Yanaga appears in the back. It's a cartoon too. I do, so you yeah. Can look at it. <laughs> it emphasizes her very crucial point that no one cares about England. Yeah, that's and, right. <laughs> uh, I highly, highly recommend it. It's very affordable. Uh, so put it under the Christmas tree. And you have a new book coming out in January? I do indeed, yeah. It's like a girl is always selling. So yeah, it's, it's available for pre-order, The Once in Future Sex. Just like, just, it's available. You could pre-order it, um, which is good. But uh, yeah, the comic book is out there. I would say um, it is, it's, a, it's a good introduction. Um, if you are going to give it to kids, it do be talking about sex. Oh yeah. So like you know, yeah. be, be ready for that. I know I got someone was mad at me online the other day and said, "How dare you recommend this to nine year olds?" I'm like, "Homie, I did not." So like, <laughs> I don't know where you got that from, but okay, you know. So yeah, it's got it. It, it it's graphic because it has pictures, but it's also graphic because there's some swears. Yeah. It's, you know, I wrote it. What are you going to do? But it's, uh, but let's give our guests another round of applause. They're here for the rest of the con. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>